All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, tangent spaces, basis vectors, and Riemannian metric in the context of information geometry. Okay. So in particular, let's start with um, this idea of <coughs> an infinitesimal line segment. So when d theta right, is an infinitesimally small line segment, right? the square of its length which I'm going to denote by ds well let me call the length ds it's like in the square of its length ds is given by the following so ds squared right I'm going to define to be two times the Bregman divergence of a point theta and a nearby point theta plus d theta. Okay, so again, the picture you might want to have in your mind is that there's a point theta, there's a infinitesimal line segment d theta, and uh, you know you pretend that you can add those two things together, theta plus d theta to give you two points now on this manifold, and you want to apply two times the Bregman divergence to that. Okay, anyway, so this turns out to be equal to the sum of gij d theta i d theta j, we sum over i and j. <coughs> uh, and as you might expect, it's like these uh, superscripts here mean that you look at the components of this uh, line segment, right? So the um, sort of upper indices I and J represent components. Okay, then you can check that that this um, sort of mass matrix or metric tensor, right, um, or Riemannian metric, Gij is given by um, the Hessian, it's like, of the uh, convex function. gij as a function of theta is equal to the Hessian <coughs> of the convex function, which defines the Bregman divergence. Okay. All right. Uh, and of course, it's like, if you recall, it's like the assumption is that Hessian is positive definite, right? Okay. All right, so let's say now you have some coordinate system. Okay, and then you can imagine tangent vectors to that coordinate system as giving you now a basis for the tangent space uh, to a given point. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the remark is that the 
sort of basis, well, let me just rephrase that, the tangent space is spanned by the sort of tangent vectors to the coordinate axes. of the chart. Okay, so uh, so if this direction is, um, let's say, Q1, and this direction is Q2, right, then um, there are various types of notation, but one of the common notations is that this tangent vector in the Q1 direction is denoted by the partial respect to Q1, and this tangent vector here is denoted by the partial respect to Q2, okay? So in the book, um, this is denoted as E sub 1, this is denoted as E sub 2, okay? Um, so you might see, it's like, <coughs> whenever you write these indices, that there's some notion of um, upper and lower indices, right? Um, and that's going to be important because there's what is called the Einstein summation convention. And a lot of times when people write this down, it's like um, particularly, it's like when doing tensor analysis or Riemannian geometry, there is uh, an implicit summation. So, you know, here I've explicitly written down the sum over i and j, uh, but it's very common to omit the sum and then just realize that there is an implicit summation because there's a raised i and a lowered i, and they're repeated raised and lowered indices. And so there's a sum over i implicitly because there's a raised and lowered i. There's a sum over j implicitly because there's a raised and lowered j, okay? Um, and then here it's like you have a raised one, but because it's in the denominator, that corresponds to a lowered one here, right? So there's, there's some logic to all of this. It's like, and it takes a little bit of time to get used to it. Um, and, but again, suffice to say, it's like there is significance to whether or not the indices are raised or lowered, okay? And <clears throat> if they are um, one raised and one lowered, it's like there's a natural pairing between the two. Uh, if you ha end up pairing things, it's like where both are raised <clears throat> or both are lowered, it's like then somehow it's like the metric is going to have to come into play when you want to pair those two things together, okay? All right, so, uh, so that's just some uh, observation. It's like, and you know, as you get more familiar with that, it's like it will become um, more and more natural. But uh, initially for now, it's like, I would just emphasize that it is important. Um, I mean, it's like whether or not something is raised or lowered has some sort of significance to it. Okay, so let me just leave it at that for now. All right, <clears throat> but anyhow, it's like, uh, so in the context of this, um, you know, you have a curved space, you have some notion of a tangent plane, it's like to a point, it's like on this space, and then it's like you want to find some sort of basis vectors for that tangent space, and the tangent space is always a vector space, right? So one very natural way it's like to construct a basis um, for that tangent space is to look at the coordinate uh, charts, right? And the coordinate charts give you these coordinate axes, which are just curves, and if you look at the tangent vector to each of those curves, it's like at that point which you're trying to um, find a basis for the tangent space to, then these things will span that tangent space, right? They form a basis for that tangent space. Okay. With that now, Okay, so this E sub 1, E sub 2, this is going to give you the basis for a tangent vector, or for the tangent space, it's like at a particular point, right? So the vector space <coughs> spanned by these EIs. <coughs> is the tangent space. Of 
m at each point. Okay, and and then the, the point is that since we're primarily looking at affine, it's like coordinate systems, these tangent vectors are essentially the same, right? So here it's like I'm drawing what's happening, it's like in a curved space, um, but in an fi coordinate system, fi manifold, it's like, you know, it, it really is sort of just pointing in the same direction all the time. Okay, so since theta is an fi coordinate system, this set of vectors looks the same at every point. Okay. <coughs> so I can rewrite a tangent vector um, using that basis of, uh, of the tangent space, right? So it can write any tangent vector um, A as the following. So A is written as the sum over A super I E sub I, right? So this is the basis vectors, right? And then the A super I's you should think of as the coordinates um, of that, um, you know, it's like um, tangent vector, if you will, right? Um, okay. And again, it's like you have this raised and lowered repeated index thing, and a lot of times you omit the summation sign when that happens. Okay. And then a small line segment. theta, right, can be expressed as d theta equals, again, the sum d theta i. Well, so now d theta superscript i is the component, i've component of d theta, right, e i. Okay, <clears throat> so you have the primal coordinates, okay, um, and as you might expect, it's like <clears throat> via this duality which we discussed, it's like you can construct dual coordinates on this, right? So you can construct uh, E star I. which are the, the tangent vectors of the dual affine coordinate curves. Of the dual coordinate system, uh, which I denoted by theta star. Right, and then now d theta star is equal to the sum over d theta star i, e star i. <coughs> so here um, we ref reflect the fact that this is a dual coordinate system um, by having the indices, it's like in the superscript position instead of the subscript position, right? So, uh, so that's something to be mindful of. And then uh, I can write A in this new coordinate system as A sub I, E star I, right? <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, so again, it's like, you know, you're you have a situation where <coughs> the superscripts and subscripts matter. <coughs> and, be 
because you have two coordinate systems it's like with the same tangent space right um, <coughs> you can write say any arbitrary tangent vector in terms of either representation and in general the components a sub i are not equal to a so a super i is not necessarily equal to a sub i right So anyway, yeah, so <clears throat> as I said, it's like, you know, this sort of summation, it's like becomes a little bit cumbersome. So that leads to what is called the Einstein summation convention. So when the same index appears twice, once as uh, an upper index, and another as a lower index, then summation over that repeated index is assumed. Even without the summation uh, symbol. So in the context of, for example, this coordinate representation, we would just write that a is equal to a super i e sub i, and then there's an implicit summation over i, or we'll write this as a sub i e star i. Okay? Uh, and then we also, if you recall, it's like had this expression for the square of the length of this infinitesimal uh, line segment, right? So also uh, d squared s is equal to <coughs> d theta d theta, which is g i j d theta i d theta j. So you see that i has, is repeated. There's a raised and there's a lowered index. j is repeated. There's a raised and there's a lowered index. So there's an implicit summation over i and j here. Okay, <clears throat> all right, um, so I can rewrite this to be a little bit more explicit. This is a tangent vector. I can express this now as a linear combination of uh, sort of um, sort of tangent vectors with, in, with respect to the, uh, the basis vectors. So this is d theta i, e i, and then d theta j, e j, okay? And this is uh, just by uh, bilinearity equals to e i, e j, d theta i, d theta j. <coughs> and so that tells you that this metric is given by, so this implies that g i j is equal to this inner product between e i and e j. Okay. 
right? So, um, so this thing is, is what's going to be what's called the Riemannian metric, right? It's a way of measuring, it's like the length of vectors, it's like in tangent spaces. Uh, and then if you have something like that, it's like it introduces the notion of lengths of curves and things along those lines, okay? And as what we've observed is that um, the coordinate representation, it's like of this uh, Riemannian metric as a matrix, right, is related to, it's like the inner product, it's like between the basis vectors, it's like of the tangent space, uh, <coughs> which you're defining it on, okay? So let me sort of make some remarks. So in Euclidean space, right, then this thing would just be the dot product. Uh, and you know that the dot product uh, in Euclidean space with an autonormal coordinate system This Gij is going to be nothing more than what is called delta Ij, which is the Kronecker delta. So that's one if i is equal to j, and zero if i is not equal to j. So this is the Kronecker delta function. Okay. So, so this is perhaps a very simple example. It's like of a Riemannian manifold, right? And let me just sort of remark that in general, um, a manifold in view induced by a convex function uh, is not Euclidean. So, um, so the representation, it's like of the Riemannian metric as a matrix, right? Um, as you might expect, clearly depends, it's like on the choice of coordinates on the system. And the reason is because <coughs> the entries of the matrix, it's like, uh, are related to the inner product between the basis vectors, um, which span the tangent space. And the basis vectors you use to span the tangent space in turn depends on the choice of coordinate system, right? So more or less it's like what you expect is that for different coordinate systems, it's like you will have different matrix representations of the Riemannian metric, okay? So that should be fairly obvious, okay? So you can represent, right, the Riemannian met metric can be represented in the dual affine coordinate system. <coughs> it's called it theta star, all right? So we can write d theta star as uh, d theta star i, it's like e star i, then ds squared is equal to d theta star d theta star, which is what I call g star ij d theta i star d theta j star, okay? where, as you might expect, this g star ij is equal to the Riemannian, uh, it's like inner product of, um, you know, it's like these dual basis vectors, right? E star i, E star j.
So we know how these two coordinates are related to each other. So know that d theta star is equal to g d theta, right? And d theta is equal to g inverse d theta star. Okay, so d theta i star is equal to g i j d theta j and then d theta j is equal to g star i j d theta i star. Okay, so where these g's, these big g's and g inverses are related in the following, g is equal to g star inverse. Uh, so these two um, Riemannian uh, metric tensors are mutually inverse. Okay, so the other thing it's like, uh, which actual consequence of this, okay, is that, so you know that E star I is equal to G I J E I, and E I is equal to G I sub J E star J. Okay, <coughs> so there's another sense it's like in which the tangent vectors are dual with respect to each other. And they're dual <coughs> with respect to the metric it's like which uh, they induce. So, so the point is that E sub i and E star i are dual in the sense that if you take the inner product between one of them, with the other, you get the Kronecker delta function. And this is because, again, g is equal to g star inverse. So the bases are dual. <coughs> with respect to the Riemannian uh, inner product. <coughs> and the way it is useful is that that gives you a very quick way it's like of computing components it's like of a uh, vector if you will okay so what do i mean by that so we know that a is a super i e i which is equal to a sub i e star i right so I can take the following pair, and I can pair A with E star J. This is equal to, by definition, A I E I E star J. I can take the A I's out. This is equal to A I E I E star J. <coughs> But that inner product is only one if i is equal to j. So that's equal to a super j. Okay? So that's telling me that the j component in the primal representation can be obtained by taking the inner product of a with the dual j basis vector. And then the same thing is true if you have a paired with e sub j 
this is, I'm going to write it this way, a sub j e star i, ej, this is equal to a sub i, e star i, ej, this is only one if i is equal to j, so this means that a sub j is obtained by taking the inner product of a with e sub j, okay? All right, so anyway, so there's this nice relationship. Um, and again, it's like um, <clears throat> this, all this sort of works nicely together coming from the fact that A, the metric, comes from that convex function and the relationship between the primal and dual representations also come from that convexity relationship, all right? Okay, so, so that's, uh, you know, some additional notions of duality, it's like which will uh, see again and again uh, as the course progresses as well. So let me just stop here for now.